And welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and we are pleased to have a conversation for the next one half hour with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Illinois. And he is Thomas L. Kilbride. You call the Quad Cities home? I do, Rock Island to be more specific. And uh, you are Chief Justice for a three year period of time. How far into that are we? Uh, two years, uh, in a, another week or so. Okay, we're, we're gonna talk about cameras and mics. We're gonna talk about uh, the transparency of the court that has uh, evolved under the Chief Justice. But first, I wanna talk to him about, you weren't a judge before you made the Supreme Court. And of course, everyone knows that you're elected to the Supreme Court. In fact, I think it's 39 mm -hmm. out of 50 states have elections for, for their justices. Has, has not being a judge prior to joining the court in 2000 been a hindrance? Has it been a help? Uh, either. Well, I mean, that's a great question. I'm not sure if I've got the, a, a good answer for you. I guess it depends on your point of view. I think in one respect it's helpful in, in the sense that I came out of 20 years of practice as an attorney representing clients, and, and I, I knew that side of the, uh, the, the courtroom uh, vantage point, viewpoint. So from an administrative standpoint of the kinds of things that impact lawyers in the community in their practice, uh, I came with a fresh perspective out of that, having been someone in the courtroom on a daily basis. So I think that's an advantage. But the other thing to keep in context or <clears throat> from a, a viewpoint on this is that there's not just one judge on the Supreme Court, there's seven of us. And we all bring different uh, advantages and maybe disadvantages, uh, whoever we may be on the court. And so I think my perspective uh, is just one piece of the puzzle that, that, that hopefully helps. I want to talk about transparency for a moment. We're going to talk about specific programs that uh, you have initiated or have continued. But first, the courts, in my opinion, the courts traditionally have not been um, as open to the public as you would hope, as the public would hope. Now, I don't mean that they can't come into the courtroom, but it's just that we have jobs and families and we can't go to the courtroom. And it doesn't seem like the court system is that available to us. Uh, why the push for transparency under your uh, Chief Justice uh, tenure? Mm. Well, it's uh, something that's sort of evolved. It seems to have arisen as a natural evolution of things and uh, maybe it's a question of the right uh, opportunities and timing with uh, colleagues who are uh, equally uh, open to the idea. I'm, I'm not able really to uh, to move any project or initiative at the court unless I've got uh, consensus among my colleagues and of course each of us who serve as chief have the privilege to raise uh, projects, initiatives and uh, that just happens to be one of the categories that I've raised. Before we talk about those, uh, we probably should clarify what kinds of cases you hear. You just don't hear any kind of case. Uh, there's constitutionality cases. What else? Well, uh, the, the, from the standpoint of a, a big picture, it's we, civil and criminal cases across the board. Until the legislature uh, abolished the death penalty in Illinois, all the capital death penalty cases automatically came to the Illinois Supreme Court. And as you know, Rolling back the clock a bit, uh, when before Governor George Ryan commuted uh, the sentences of a number of, well, not a number, all the Capitol Row uh, defendants, uh, all those cases were on our docket. We probably had a full uh, week's worth of cases that were death penalty related, either direct appeals or what they call post-conviction uh, appeals uh, after the first round of appeals. and. Uh, and so all that's kind of, go not kind of, it has gone by the wayside. So otherwise we take uh, cases that present uh, issues of first impression, never decided before in the state of Illinois. We take cases that resolve conflicts between one appellate district and another. There are five appellate districts in the state of Illinois. And as you mentioned, uh, questions of uh, constitutionality. For example, if a local judge here in the 10th Judicial Circuit were to strike an Illinois state statute down as unconstitutional, that case would automatically be appealed to our court, among other uh, ki kinds of cases. Let's talk about specific projects that uh, the Supreme Court has been involved in or has undertaken. Uh, you have an e-business committee. Can you explain the purpose behind that? I, I think it makes sense. It, it's, it's talking about uh, the internet, but. 
Right. Well, e-business is a, a fancy title that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's not that fancy, but it's something you came up with that, uh, you know, the business of the courts that we need to get into the electronic digital age uh, to make advantage of, to use uh, the benefits of technology. And the primary, most specific example is e-filing. Uh, so that uh, we can begin to move away from paper filings because the amount of money that taxpayers are funding for courts, whether it's in the 10th Judicial Circuit or any other circuit in the 100 or counties in the 100, 102 counties uh, in the state of Illinois, pay a lot of money just for the, the, the to manage and hold and store all the paper that comes through the door uh, filed by litigants. and. Uh, and the storage of it is, is tremendous. The amount of money that it takes just to buy the uh, what they call the jackets, the file folder that the case file goes into, uh, that adds up uh, as well. So we're really focusing uh, primarily at this point on, on e-filing of documents, but many of the circuits uh, are involved in uh, pilot projects for what are called e-guilty pleas. And uh, we're also uh, working in the arena more on a pilot basis for what are called e-warrants to do where a judge can see the paperwork and electronically sign off on it. Uh, and that's something that's uh, happening around the country. I was at a conference just recently on language access issues and one of the judges who was talking at the conference mentioned about how she was able to uh, handle, even during the conference, uh, search warrants that were presented to her while she was in the state of Texas, and I can't remember if Kentucky or where she was from, and she was able to process that paperwork remotely, uh, electronically, in a secure fa fashion. And obviously saving money eventually. Absolutely. Let's talk about another committee that uh, you're a, a proponent of, and that's a pro bono publico uh, legal services committee. Mm -hmm. um, now, doesn't the, uh, does the, the uh, Illinois uh, or maybe, maybe it's the American Bar Association, suggests that attorneys give 50 hours a year. Does this go beyond that, or what's the purpose of the committee? Well, <clears throat> we don't have a, uh, uh, a direct committee that's right now uh, framed as a public uh, pro bono uh, committee. We did in the past have one, and, uh, but, but we're actually, it's very good timing on your part, H, because the, the Access to Justice Commission that we started became the 29th state in the nation to set up an Access to Justice Commission, and we're holding our first conference next week in Chicago, trying to make the courts more user-friendly to uh, uh, deal with the explosion of litigants who are coming into court self-represented, meaning not with an attorney, and uh, trying to find lawyers to help fill that need to represent folks. So one of the committees that the Access to Justice Commission is, is uh, organizing is a pro bono services committee. And uh, just this week, this month, and yesterday, in Chicago, the National Legal Services Corporation, that's the body uh, funded by the federal government that provides uh, legal aid organizations around uh, the country uh, in civil cases to represent folks who are uh, at 100% or I think it's 120% of the federal poverty guideline to make lawyers available. Well, there's not enough lawyers to, to meet that demand, and, and as you know, uh, people are losing their homes and, and uh, through mortgage foreclosures and other kinds of things. And uh, so that committee is going to address those kinds of uh, demands. This is early on in that, in that committee's efforts. That's correct. Okay. Uh, let's, let's turn to cameras and mics in the courts. And um, I, I don't know if the viewer is going to be as excited as I am about this. <laughs> right. But I think they should be. Uh -huh. um, it, it's going to open up... Uh, a, a whole new dimension to how the media covers the courtroom. Uh, let's talk about, in general, why you decided to do this. And I, I understand it took all seven justices, but mm. I will remind you that the Illinois News Broadcasters Association, on six prior occasions, petitioned for cameras and mics in the court, most recently, I think, in 2003. And then, without a petition, the court says, let's experiment, let's go ahead with cameras and mics. Why? Well, it, uh, I, I, you know the background on this, uh, the story on, with, with my personal history. I come from the Quad Cities. Uh, and the reason it's the Quad Cities, it's, it's uh, part of the Iowa, uh, Rock Island, Davenport, Iowa, Moline, et cetera, Bettendorf, Iowa. Across the river in Iowa, they've had cameras in the courtrooms for probably close to 30 years. You, you probably know the answer to that question better than I do. But the point is, during my entire legal career as a practicing attorney, I have been able to watch courtroom coverage 
of proceedings from Iowa on our local TV stations, whether it's ABC, NBC, CBS, public television, uh, and so forth. And the friends that I have had in the past, whether they're lawyers or judges, have indicated how well it worked in Iowa. And in fact, uh, there's been cameras in the courtroom in Wisconsin and uh, even in Missouri for uh, a number of years. And, and Indiana has experimented with it somewhat before we did in Illinois. And uh, you and your colleagues and have, have prompted me over the years, uh, when are we going to get cameras in the courtroom here in Illinois? And I think the last time I visited with you, you asked me that question before I was uh, actually in the... Every time you're on the program, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> well, you don't have to because we're doing it now. But, uh, but uh, when I became chief in October of uh, 2010, after the retention election, that was in November. So really the first opportunity for me to visit with my colleagues after the election um, was in January of 2011. And I proposed that project to my colleagues as an experiment, as a pilot project, and uh, my colleagues, uh, thankfully, gratefully, were uh, open to the idea, and so we've, we've started to roll it out slowly, but uh, it's gaining momentum throughout the state. And right now, cameras and mics are approved in, I think, five circuits? Yeah, and, and I'm not sure. Uh, five, I think, the last time we talked about it, and, and I don't have uh, our communications director at my elbow to tell Joe, me. Joe Tiber. Joe Tiber, right. But uh, I think right now, uh, among the total number of circuits, it, it translates, equates into 23 counties. And we're soon, uh, DuPage, uh, Collar County just came on, on board. Uh, Kane and McHenry and Lake, three of the other Collar counties around Chicago, we anticipate are... Uh, or either have filed or are going to file soon for permission. And we also anticipate that Cook County, where Chicago is, uh, will probably uh, be requesting permission before the end of the year, and we hope uh, to have them uh, moving forward before the end of this calendar year. I haven't heard uh, the um, Ninth Circuit or the Tenth Circuit or the Eleventh Circuit, uh, well, which are central Illinois. Sure. Uh, the, the Tenth Circuit, uh, to their credit, early on, Chief Judge Brandt, had initially asked for uh, permission and uh, uh, to uh, experiment as a pilot project. And through conversations, because of the other number of um, circuits that were also asking for permission, it was decided really, I think, collectively among a number of the chiefs that rather than putting too many online, so to speak, at once, that it would be better to uh, try and, and roll it out in a more gradual basis. So in a uh, through mutual consent, uh, the Tenth Circuit's application was deferred, and I know that there have been conversations with the chief judge uh, recently, the last month or so, and uh, I believe, if I understand this correctly, there's a meeting with uh, the media representatives, including you and your colleagues, coming up within the month to talk about the pragmatics, the mechanics of how it gets done. So um, uh, I anticipate that it may uh, roll out, as they say here in the Tenth Circuit of Peoria, uh, and, the, and the surrounding counties in the, in the near future. And for the benefit of the audience, the Tenth Circuit is five counties. It's uh, Putnam, Marshall, Stark, Peoria, and Tazewell. And then the Ninth Circuit is McLean County. The Eleventh is down Fulton and McDonough. The Fourteenth already has cameras and mics. Um, have you had any feedback yet on how this is working so far? Well, the feedback uh, has been good so far. There really haven't been any problems. And... Um, uh, it's been positive, whether it's been in the 14th or uh, in the 21st, that's Kankakee County specifically, and, and the other uh, circuits around the state that are experimenting with it. Uh, let's move on to uh, the impact of money. Um, you ran for retention two years ago. Uh, the uh, Civil Justice League raised a lot of money, um, as did you, and in, in order to, uh, they were trying to they were focused on one particular case. Uh, are you concerned about money with, as I mentioned, there's 39 states that have elected justices. Is, is money starting to be a problem with maintaining the neutrality of the court? Well, it's a definite problem. Uh, the impact is an issue that, <clears throat> excuse me, needs to be reviewed all the time. But I, I think, uh, to answer your question directly, am I concerned about it? Yes. Uh, the impact uh, is a direct impact on the, the citizens of our community who vote and who also, I guess, form opinions about uh, what they believe uh, uh, a judge may or may not think. Um, and if we look 
and I, I guess you wouldn't see this as much here in the Peoria area, but where I live in the Quad Cities, because Iowa is uh, targeted as a swing state, I have the benefit or a disadvantage, if you will, of seeing uh, ad nauseum the uh, negative advertising in the presidential election on both sides of the of the spectrum, whether it's the uh, Romney camp or the President Obama camp. Uh, it's negative commercials either paid by the campaigns or paid by these third party groups. And the thing I fear the most about negative advertising, and that's what happens with this money, it's not out there to promote people, it's out there to tear folks down, is that it's uh, going to discourage voters from vo voting. I think they may get fed up, and I hope people don't, because I think as citizens we have an obligation to go to the polls, to vote, to, to be educated about the issues and about the candidates. And that's, that's the real harm, whether it's in judicial elections or, or other elections. And so, yes, I'm concerned about it. And uh, I don't have any answers. I don't have any solutions. One of the biggest contributors across <clears throat> the country to judicial races is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And in one study from 1992 to 2010, business won 71% of uh, related cases that came before the judiciary in, the, in those states where they contributed. Is there a fear? even if it is a perception that the U.S. Chamber may have undue influence? Or does money influence your decision? Well, it, it can influence any of our decisions uh, because uh, each of us who, uh, even in, in my situation with my retention election in 2010, I was not directly or even indirectly involved in raising of any funds. We have to set up in Illinois, we have sort of a, a barrier, a firewall to use a computer uh, term for it by analogy, uh, put around us where we have a group of responsible citizens, whether they're lawyers or non-lawyers, who uh, uh, do the solicitation to handle the funds and make the decisions on how to spend uh, the money for the campaign. So we keep <clears throat> that knowledge uh, off of our radar screen. So that's a built-in systematic structural way to, uh, to uh, protect us. I want to talk about the makeup of courts. Um, and I'm going to start with the U.S. Supreme Court in that I want to talk about diversity. Right now, the U.S. Supreme Court has nine justices. Six of them are Catholic, three are Jewish. And there are certain parties who have written about concerns that there may not be enough religious diversity on that particular court. And uh, to, to take it further, we might talk about geographic, we might talk about ethnicity, et cetera. Now, in Illinois, Geographic isn't a problem because there are representatives from the, the, fi the five different districts, Cook County getting a, a, a fair share of them. Uh, is, is there some way of assuring that there's diversity on a court that is elected? Well, uh, I mean, the contrast, just to start we're, we're with your question, I mean, the, the federal system of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is appointed. Uh, Illinois, by our Constitution, were elected. And the only way to assure diversity uh, through elections is uh, by the will of the people. They, they elect who's going to be uh, serving on the Illinois Supreme Court. And I, and I would point this out, that of our seven members on the Illinois Supreme Court, we now have three women who are members. It's the first time ever in the history of the court. And actually, since I, um, when I joined the court in 2000, 12 years ago, uh, Justice Marianne McMorrow was the first woman ever on the court. She uh, soon thereafter became the first Chief Justice, and then uh, actually only a few months after I started, uh, Justice Rita Garman from the Danville uh, Fourth District joined the co court, became the second woman. So right now, uh, I guess if we had uh, one more change on the court and a fourth woman came on, that, that would be the majority on the court. So at least there's some diversity if you, uh, and I think we should always consider gender as an issue of diversity as well. Uh, I want to turn to um, the, the limitations put on, I suppose, judges across the state of Illinois, including the, the justices on the Supreme Court. Is there any kind of rule that prevents judges or justices from participating in political events? Well, <clears throat> yes. Uh, in Illinois, under our uh, judicial code of conduct, judges, whether they are a candidate or a sitting active non-candidate judge, incumbent judge, incumbent I guess suggests an election, but, but, but somebody who's active as a judge, but not in an election, under both scenarios, judges are guided by various rules. 
and uh, the rules for judges who have to campaign open the door a little bit more but still restrain judges from becoming too active uh, in a political kind of traditional conventional political kind of way. Can you support other uh, political candidates that are running for uh, office? A uh, judge or a candidate to become a judge at that time, that's the only exception. But, it, but for example, for myself right now, I'm not a candidate. I'm not uh, up for retention, so I'm, I'm not allowed to endorse anyone. But if, like for example, in 2010, I was allowed under our rules to endorse other candidates. But uh, I don't know that I really, I don't believe I did. I may have, but I don't recall that I did. The reason I bring it up is there's an associate judge down in St. Clair County who uh, there's a dispute over a shoving match. She was wearing a T-shirt supporting the Republican candidate in that particular race, and she bumped into, or <laughs> the Democratic candidate bumped into her. There's a difference of opinion. And I was wondering why she, is she allowed to wear a T-shirt? Um, well, if she's, uh, I guess the, the, the more precise question, and I'm not criticizing your question, but uh, under, un, uh, no, <laughs> no, under our rules would be, you know, whether or not, it, you know, whatever her activity was, was it an endorsement, and is she a, a candidate for judge? I don't, I don't know any and, of the particulars in I, that case. I don't know whether she's a candidate or not. Yeah. She's I, is an she, if she judge. is, uh, but she might be running for surrogate judge. I mean, that would yep. be the mm -hmm. one example scenario where it would be allowed. Yeah. Um, uh, you not, mentioned, not the shoving, by the way. Just the I understand. <laughs> I think we I think that's clear. Uh, uh, Chief Judge here in the Tenth Circuit, Michael Brandt, uh, has uh, started a couple of veterans courts. Is uh, is that common around the state of Illinois? And are we going to see more of these specialty courts? And how are they beneficial? Yeah. Well, it it uh, it's not the first and only court. There are other veterans courts around the state. I can't tell you the exact number. But there are other specialty courts as well. Probably the most uh, prominent specialty court that we have is drug courts uh, that deal with individuals who have come into the criminal court system and have a problem with drugs. And the other category is mental health courts. And to answer your question about are they beneficial, I think absolutely so. Um, and I, I'll give you an example with the, the individuals in, in drug court. Uh, there's two groups of people who come in with the drug history. They're either addicted where it's a, an illness, a disease that needs to be handled, or they're simply drug abusers who are not yet addicted. And I don't, you know, I don't have any experience to, from a personal standpoint to tell you where that line is. But depending on how that person is char characterized, categorized, the treatment, the way they're handled, disposed in court makes a huge difference. And we've uh, spent a fair amount of time involving judges and training uh, to make sure you have judges who are trained and know the difference and so that the disposition somebody should go to go to jail as opposed to get some uh, treatment to, to resolve the problem and, and they drug courts have been quite successful and taxpayers should be happy with that because the amount of money we save turning somebody's life around and getting them off of drugs and it's not the court system's obligation to do that but but through these other programs that exist in the community where courts can make referrals to these community groups, uh, what the partnership in the local community level is really beneficial. Is there a cost savings in that it frees up uh, the regular court? Well, absolutely, and, and, and I think the, the final disposition, if somebody doesn't end up in the Department of Corrections is a, in, in jail, saves the taxpayers money. Now, obviously, if they're criminal in the sense that they present a, a danger to the community, then they should be behind bars. So we're talking about nonviolent uh, drug possession kinds of cases and, and other uh, drug uh, problems. The Illinois Department of Corrections has 49,000 and some change inmates behind bars right now, uh, pushing a record number, if not a record number. Uh, is there any effort or is there any concern about the ability of judges to properly sentence uh, a person who has been convicted because of the overcrowding issue? Well, that's a, a wonderful question. I'm not sure that I uh, know the, uh, the best answer for that, but uh, let me give you one slice that, that might begin to address your question. In, uh, in brief. Sure, okay. Well, well uh, we're, you know, we need help to be able to do it, and the problem is the state government has cut back our budget tremendously that's impacted the probation department and the probation department are the folks that, that do the pre-sentencing studies 
and, and I'm doing this very quickly, but without the proper pre-sentencing study, uh, and it's difficult to get it done when you don't have enough people and you don't have enough staff and resources, judges are sometimes disadvantaged because they don't have the background that they need to have uh, to adequately assess to, to make proper sentencing dispositions, but they're still doing the right thing. Justice Thomas L. Kilbride, thank you so much for joining us on that issue. Well, thank you. And we'll be back next week with another edition when we talk to state legislators about the upcoming veto session. Please join us then for At Issue.